Hello viewers, this is SkyFi Audio coming at you from Glen Rock, New Jersey, where we specialize in restorations and sales of vintage equipment, much like this, what we've got today, uh, a Krell uh, three-piece stack from the mid-90s. Um, about a year ago, we reviewed the Krell KPA, which is what's sitting here at the bottom. It's a Krell Phono Amplifier. Um, and what we've been doing over the last year is assembling of the rest of the Krell stack for the ultimate Krell 90s preamplifier. Um, we've gotten three pieces so far. We're still looking for a second KPA to, uh, to complete our setup. And I'll explain to you why we've got so many boxes and why uh, we're going through the trouble of assembling something from the 90s. Now Krell is, is, is a company that is still around. In the 90s, there were quite the stir. Um, there's circuit topology in, in solid state design was, was unmatched in the industry and they secured a pretty good size of the super high-end audio market. Um, and this is no exception. Um, we'll go through, take a look inside, tell you why we've got three boxes and how we're going to configure and what sort of benefits we're gonna get from it. I'll just give you a spin around so you can see what we're dealing with in terms of you know, construction quality and, and design. So let me go through the naming convention first. So the KBL is a Krell Balanced Line Preamplifier. That's what the three letters stand for. And the KPA, as mentioned before, is the Phono. So back in 1991, when this came out, uh, the, the CD was, was taken hold. So a lot of manufacturers stop including a Phono section into their preamps. Uh, this is exactly that. Um, it gave them a little bit more space internally. It allowed them to manage costs and it allowed not to sell superfluous circuitry to clients that weren't gonna use it. So in the 90s, if you were shopping for a Krell, you would, if the CD was your main source, you would buy a KBL, and if you had a turntable, you would add to it a KPA, and you would actually run them both from the same external power supply, which is sitting right here, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. So now, if you wanted to go a step before, above that, uh, you would do what we've done here, which is essentially split the duties of the line stage to both left and right channels independently in two separate chassis. Now, that's pretty esoteric, and that's going very, very far, but that's what this hobby's about, and a lot of the fun comes from it. So you would essentially crack these open and assign uh, some dip switches so that uh, one amplifier or preamplifier become left channel, and one would become the right channel. So why would you want to do that? Well, in terms of circuitry, although these are fully balanced designs, meaning that the circuitry inside is separated completely between left and right channels, if you add a second box and dedicate one per channel, you can go into what's called a dual mono balanced design, which is the absolute top of the top. So what you're doing is you're essentially taking uh, the left channel and non, the non-inverted signal from the left channel, and then you would take the inverted signal from the right channel and essentially create a, a, a pure balanced output. So how do you do that? Well, Krell was, was uh, smart enough to include a series of dip switches inside that will allow you to do it yourself rather than have to go sending it back to the factory. So um, you would essentially remove the screws from the top unit, which I've done already. And then set a bunch of dip switches, you see them here highlighted in red. And that would essentially um, reconfigure the preamp for dual mono. Uh, and then you would abandon one set of inputs and outputs completely. And if you were using single ended, you would use, I believe it's the right channel. Um, so, this again would become your, let's say left channel, this become your right channel. Now we're still on the lookout for another KPA and what will that do? Well, it's an yet another step above that. It would allow us to then take the phono section and go into the uh, dual mono balanced configuration, which would then result in a four box design. On the power supply side, then we, are have, the, we have some choices to make. We could either use one power supply to power most of the boxes or we could essentially assign one power supply per each of the uh, boxes. I think we're probably gonna do a, a one supply per two chassis uh, once we get the next uh, KPA. 
Um, a look inside sort of also tells you a lot about Krell and their design philosophy. I mean, look how beautiful this is in terms of <laughs> the circuitry layout, the part selection, you know, anything from the super high quality uh, metal film resistors with very tight tolerances, very high quality capacitors. Circuit boards are absolutely as high in quality as they get. And the layout is crazy. I mean, this is somebody with OCD certainly designed this. Um, paying attention to not just the circuit topology, but also aesthetics, which sort of shows pride in, in the work. Another neat feature here is that the input selector knobs here have long shafts that uh, connect to the actual selectors or switches in the rear, allowing you for a very short signal path tra traverse from the jacks to the source selector switches. That's kind of neat. You can also uh, make note here of the dual very, very high quality volume control encased in, in, in some sort of metal. Look how beautiful that work is as well. Thickness of the front panel, it's gotta be at least half an inch right there. And the uh, obviously the, the very high quality connectors used throughout both XLR and the single ended. Um, this here is the connector for the power supply that we discussed before. So it's essentially just a standard nine pin DB9 connector. And you would either daisy chain them or dedicate a power supply for each of the chassis. Now talking a bit about the power supply, this is it right here. It's almost large enough to be an amplifier. It is um, a fully discrete, double regulated uh, power supply capable of swinging about 60 volts peak to peak. Um, so that results in, in this preamp's ability to to pretty much uh, send the signal down the longest of cables you could come up with. You could pretty much uh, connect your preamplifier in your house and, and run the amplifier in your neighbor's house with a you know, 50 meter cable and still have enough voltage left over to power it. A bit overkill, but that's what this sort of hobby is about at this level is, is sort of building things uh, in overkill. So how would you use this preamp in a dual mono com configuration, right? So there's so many knobs what exactly would you use to control the volume? Uh, input selector is simple. You would just essentially select left channel, right channel, and match your inputs. But what about the volume? You know, is it this one or, or is it this one or, or what? Um, in, in earlier curl designs, it was a disaster. You, you certainly had to um, precisely locate the volume controls every time you wanted to change something. So if you wanted to go up a step, you'd have to finally adjust it and retweak it for balance adjustment. Well, Krell did a, a bit better with this particular piece using these indicator lights. Um, these lights would essentially turn off once the preamp has reached a, a balance configuration, meaning that you would essentially watch the LED and adjust the volume control until you had a balanced situation and the LEDs indicated so. So that's kind of neat. Another, um, and then for the symmetry, uh, symmetry is essentially your balance control. So you would use this to offset one channel from the other. So if um, rather than adjust balance by having one of the levels higher than the other, you would just do an, uh, an adjustment there. You'd probably take down the channel or increase the gain in one of the channels. Another neat feature is these beautiful, these are actually switches, believe it or not, here in the, there's a phase inversion switch here and a gain stage switch, which is pretty neat how they flush mounted it as well as the logo. The logo is also machined into a piece of aluminum, which is flush mounted into the front panel. Very striking. So in the 1990s, uh, what would be a great amplifier to use with? Well, we've got one right here that's about to get shipped. Let me swing the camera over. Here's the KSA100S, very sought after, 100 watt solid state, a class A amplifier from Carell with a sliding bias. So that'd be neat. Obviously it matches aesthetically. All right, another thing. So let's talk about, about their design circuitry. Um, you know, Corel went through great, great pains to make this a fully class A uh, regulated design topology. And it is um, high biased and direct coupled. There are no capacitors in the signal path, which is uh, quite a feat to do from an engineering point of view, but they believe that's the best signal you can have. All right, I think that covers it. Uh, the monitor switches we didn't talk about, this would be to, um, 
for tape decks uh, to monitor your, your tape deck paths. And then check out our other video that we did about a year ago on the KPA because I think we took the lid off and went through the uh, intricate settings for uh, both moving coil and moving magnet for the KPA, which is pretty neat. All right, so there you have it. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe to our channel. That'll keep us motivated to keep moving, creating these videos for you. And visit us at uh, skyfiaudio.com to see some of the great pieces that we've restored and uh, are up for sale. All right, thanks for watching.